we've got a question already. Um, and it say, it's from Arbivir. And Arbivir wants to know how long you've been playing squash. This is from Arbivir. A long time. I, I started when I was four years old. So um, 29 years now, which when I put it like that, I don't think I've ever said that out loud. It's quite a long time, isn't it? <laughs> All my life, put it that way. And what about um, letting Arbivir know? Who how did you get introduced to squash? I so my whole family plays I've got one brother one sister um my mum and dad both played as well um I think although it's kind of one of those sort of slightly in folklore but I think I went down when my brother started playing so he's eight years older than me so he'd have been 12 and I think I just kind of tagged along then and never left the club after that It's a tricky one. I mean, at first, I, I was really conscious of trying to kind of adapt all my training to be very squash specific. Um, but considering it's probably it's likely to last a while, now I've kind of moved more to just doing stuff that I kind of not enjoy necessarily, but um, I'm not putting too many restrictions on it. So I'm running a lot, um, which is something I do do actually quite enjoy. Um, and then apart from that, just doing some like body weight circuit stuff at home, a bit of skipping, um, getting on, I've got an indoor bike as well. So getting on the bike. So just kind of all, you know, like gym based stuff, but I'm not doing any, I've not even seen my squash racket for five weeks or whatever it is. So I'm not doing any ghosting or anything like that, unfortunately, but uh, yeah, just mainly running, I'd say. I think it's a real, it's a great time to be able to work on your skills for sure. Cause um it's something that you can, you know, like if you're, um, I don't know, if, you, if you've got a wall, you can, you can pretty much do whatever you like, can't you? So you can, you can work on your sort of ball control and things like that for sure. But it's, um, for me, I, I'm at the stage now where if I can't sort of play properly, I, I sort of like to stay. I, I've always been a bit like that. I, I kind of like to stay off court until I can really go bananas on court. So <laughs> that's kind of what I've been doing. Or oh, why I've why I've not necessarily sort of picked up a racket or anything like that. And Paul said, "Has your game changed over from the time when you were a junior?" Yes. <laughs> yeah, it changed a lot. Um, I was. I don't know. I guess I, as a junior, I wasn't particularly fit. I was a much more of a kind of attacking. Well, I still I still am pretty attacking, but I was a very sort of make a lot of errors, hit a lot of tins, go for a lot of shots, be a bit wild, be a bit crazy. Um, definitely still got a bit of that in me, but um, I've sort of, I guess, matured as I've got older and I play a, a more structured game now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's changed a lot. My techniques changed a lot. Everything's kind of developed and yeah. I have a question just to back on to that. When did you, when did you think that you really made that change or, or was, um, it like, was it organic or did you just like i don't know get to a point where you said you know what if i'm gonna get better at it was there a kind of a epiphany where you decided that or what happened no well i guess as soon as i turned professional i sort of i very much my mindset turned into that of a of a job and being professional and training twice a day and then I guess I, I sort of surrounded myself whether it was consciously or subconsciously with very sort of professional people as well so I trained a lot with um, Pete Barker who you would know like an English yeah. English guy mm -hmm. very professional very, very diligent with all his work yeah um, and then sort of like I, I was exposed to kind of national squads where there was a lot of what well, believe it or not when I started people like Peter Nickel, Lee Beach all were still part of those squads so um, yeah, I was kind of just, I guess, exposed to a lot of high professionalism and that sort of rubs off on you a bit. And then technique wise, probably that was a bit more organic, I guess. Um, sort of taking on board bits and pieces from different coaches and then sort of figuring out what works best for me, really. Right, right. Um, this question's from Adam. Adam said, um, which, strength exercise, which strength training exercise are you pursuing? I well I've, I'm not um, I certainly did when I was younger but I don't actually do a lot of like weight exercises anymore um, as in 
before before lockdown and before um, coronavirus and everything. So I do a lot of body weight stuff, like a lot of body weight squats and um, uh, like um, yeah lunges, all all that sort of more circuit based stuff. But I don't, I mean, I don't actually have access mm -hmm. to any weights, so I wouldn't be able to do any if, even if I wanted to. But mainly just doing um, yeah body weight stuff, and then my um, strength and conditioning trainer for the last few years is big on um, running as a form of strength training. So he's, he's a big believer that, and he's, I think he's right, that running really strengthens all the, the relevant muscles for squash. So that's kind of, I guess, my, my main form of, of strength training. Okay. Um, so, and this next one's from Eli. Eli said, how do you set goals for yourself in squash? Do you base it on abilities, rankings, specific tournament results? Question mark. Question mark. Uh, it's a yeah, it's a tricky one. I mean, I don't, I don't um, sort of set ranking targets because that's there is an element of luck in in squash and the draws you get and things like that. So I tend to at the start of the season I'll set a goal of. Um, a level of player I'd like to be or the level of or how many players of that level so for example this year I would have I can't actually remember exactly but I would have set myself a goal of beating a top eight in the world player um, and then kind of everything else takes care of itself I mean it's a bit of a cliche but you try and just be the best you can be and and that's goals are a great thing to to have to maybe try and spur you on but I've never struggled with the motivation of kind of training hard and, and trying to be as good as I can be so uh, I guess that's my main my well and, and the other cliche I guess is that my one of my main goals is always to stay stay fit and healthy and if I am then I generally kind of do all right so yeah that's probably it um this one is from Rich and Rich says who are your favorite and least favorite people to play on the circuit and why I had that question as well. Rich. Yeah, that's that. a good one. There's, yeah. yeah, it's tricky. I mean, of the players still playing now, there's no one that I really dislike playing, I'd say, uh, anymore. There used to be a lot of players that I really dislike playing. Like, I guess, I mean, he is still playing. Gaultier, officially, he's still on the rankings. But he would have been one that I hated playing. because he, he's just why just I know the way you told me by but maybe these guys don't know why yeah well it's just the way his style of play i mean a lot of people don't like playing him obviously he's one of the best players in the world but he the way he plays he, he hits the ball hard and low so you can't really ever feel like you can volley the ball you can't get in front of him because he hits the ball so hard um and he's an unbelievable athlete so you don't feel like you're ever going to break him down um yeah so he's he's got to be one of the ones i mean because that's not really of the top players now, there's no one that's really kind of, I don't know, got that sort of Nick Matthew solidity or that sort of feeling that you always feel like that you've got a chance, put it that way. Whereas perhaps in the past, there's always been a couple of players like David Palmer or someone like that, who you think, oh, how am I ever going to beat this guy? <laughs> um, now it's a little bit more open, but at the same time, it's, it, it means there's a lot more depth as well. So there's, there's players that you can beat you outside of the top 50 or whatever whereas maybe when I started that wasn't quite the same case it would be sort of top 30 and then the rest whereas now is the, the depth is a lot stronger um so yeah so who I like playing that's what um, I was going to say who, who, who would you yeah anyone I beat I guess I mean I don't I um one thing you said was you set a target Going, but you said maybe at the beginning of this year you'd set a target potentially to try and beat someone in the top eight. Yeah. My question, kind of following from what Rich said, out of the top eight, who for you is the most beatable? Who do you? Obviously, we're all good. But who would yeah. you? If you on your, like, there might be a few there that you think, well, I don't care. It doesn't matter how well I'm playing. I'm not going to beat yeah. him. But who yeah. would you? Who would you think would be the most? vulnerable to your style of game um i'm just trying to rack my brains as to who's there i mean i, I think i don't know if I <laughs> no yeah i mean i, I, I think <laughs> off the top of my head i'd say i don't know if he is still there but miguel would be one that i would i would think right. i'd have a good chance against why um, is that 
just because I think he's, I mean, he's obviously a fantastic player, but he's quite, he's quite open. He, he right. likes, he likes right. to sort of spray the ball oh, around okay. a bit. Right. Um, we we'll take advantage of that. Yeah, which I would quite enjoy. Um, then it's, it's tricky because you have players like Gawad, for example, who on his day is, un- like he, he's unplayable on his day. Right. You can't, he would beat anyone. But then there's always that feeling that you can, you've got a chance because he does, he's, He's pretty inconsistent com- right. in he's comparison to the other. Yeah. 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 Um, what about then, Abu Abu El- Abu Gar? El- yeah, he's another one. I mean, I've played him once, and I felt pretty close to him. He's, but he's another one. I mean, he can be um. Uh, this that's kind of the thing with the top guys now. They they can be unbelievable, unplayable, and then, but there's always that sort of question mark over there. Right. You know, their their consistency. Um, I think. I think you. I think the. Um, I think Shabag, Mohammed, uh, Mohammed, Tarek, and Ali Farag are probably a little bit kind of in a, a bit of a class of their own. Late, yeah. Um, and then, but there. I mean, there's still chances there for sure. But then outside of that, I think it's it's a lot more open. Cool. Rich, does that answer your question? Is that cool? Okay. Um, so next question is from Eli and Eli says what is your explanation for why there are so many Egyptians in the top 10 both men's and women's yeah it's it's something that we get asked a lot and I think it's it's a bit boring but it's basically just down to numbers they have so many if you go to Egypt they they have a very centralized kind of playing system so they basically all play in Cairo and there's there, there is another major city, Alexandra, where a few of them play. But in Cairo, there's probably four or five main clubs. Um, and all the players, juniors upwards, play at these five clubs. And if you go there, there's just hundreds and hundreds of kids playing. And it's just sort of sheer weight of numbers means that of every 30, 13-year-olds, one's bound to be kind of um, a class above. And then if you get one from every year, all of a sudden you've got however many in the, in the top 100 in the world for the 15-year span of a professional. So, yeah. So it's I'd the size say, of the pool. It's the size yeah. of the pool and the fact that the pool is so centralised. Yeah, the primary. I think so. I think so because people always say, oh, the coach is better, things like that. But I don't, I don't think that's the case. I mean, a lot of the time they're not actually even coached. They just go down to the club and they just play. Um, but the the coaching system is a lot less um it, it's not very sort of uh organized i'd say and then you go to but then equally you would have had say um i'm just trying to think of say australia who were dominant for many years and then england were dominant for many years they would have had very strong coaching set up so yeah. i think it's more down to the, the weight of numbers rather than anything else I don't really buy into that sort of Egyptian. I mean, yes, they have got some fantastic shot players, but equally they've got some players who are fantastic length players. And in fact, most of them are very, um, they base their games around a really solid length and then, then their flair and their shots come to, for, come to the fore. So, I mean, I just think there's so many players that you're bound to have one or two um, amazing shot players, but then equally you've got sort of the under, other end of the spectrum. So, yes, there is... I, I guess I don't know. The Egyptian way of playing traditionally is kind of a bit more flary, shot playing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but I'm not so sure. I'm not so sold on that. I, th- I think there's there's ver- lots of varying different, and, and there's lots of good shot players from countries outside of Egypt. Um, and equally, there's sort of some boring players from Egypt. You know, it's kind of uh, it mixes it up. Um, so next question is from Arbivir. Um Oh, hang on. No, the next one question was from Paul. Paul said, how do you think about training? How do you think about training to focusing on fitness versus squash skill? I think um, is how do you differentiate between... I think that's what he means. Is that right, Paul? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry for the typo. Yeah, like, uh, like you can do, like, fitness or you can try doing, like, more control and stuff. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tricky one. It's, it's something that you kind of, you constantly have to think about. So, I mean, a lot of the time when you're training, playing squash, you're actually doing fitness work as well because squash is quite a hard game. So uh, anything you're doing is kind of squash specific fitness. So you do need to have some, I'd say at least one or two sessions a week where you are focusing more on your skills and not so worried about moving around and things like that, especially when you're younger. Um, but I personally, I mean, when I, my normal week, I would have one squash session, one gym session a day. And my squash session is generally quite tough because I like to sort of try and replicate what it would be like in matches and, and things like that. And then my gym session maybe can be from one end of the spectrum to the other. It can be really tough um, physical gym session or it can be a light sort of yoga or something like that. But it's always with the kind of... Um, in the back of my mind thinking about how it's going to benefit my squash so yeah i guess i guess that's the way i try and look at it i've uh, said what shot is your most favorite and why <laughs> uh it's got to be the backhand cross court nick off the volley i'd say <laughs> <laughs> I, I would have put my house on that <laughs> um, yeah <laughs> um, why is because i've hit it quite a lot <laughs> 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 Where's he go? No, I, I think I just I like the feeling of it. I think it's um, it's just one of those things where you just everyone has a shot where they kind of feel really comfortable with it, and it's that's that's one of mine. I, I love trying to set it up, but I love trying to get people to dig it out of the corner and get on the racket, and then I just I just go for it. Pop it in, <laughs> yeah, just slap it in. <laughs> um, Rich said. Um, um, have you given much thought to life after pro squash? Yeah, that, I mean, I have. And increasingly at the moment, I'm thinking long and hard about it. It's, um, it's tricky because I, I have a lot of interests, but no kind of like burning desire uh, with any of them. So, I mean, I, I would like to try and sort of remain my own boss if I could, because I think having been a professional for a long time, it'd be tricky to go into like a <clears throat> working environment in that respect. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I do think about it a lot. Um, I enjoy coaching. I, I enjoy um, being active. I enjoy kind of using my brain as well. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. There's, if Do you have a timeline or not yet? I, well, not not like a strict one. I mean, I I would like to play until the Commonwealth Games, which is 2022. So I'd be um, 35 then. So that seems like a fairly natural kind of end point if I could make it. Right. <laughs> um, but who's to say? I mean, it may be sooner, maybe later. If I'm feeling great, then I might try and hang on for a bit longer. If I'm if I'm kind of getting constantly getting injured or something like that, then um, I might knock on the head soon on the a bit sooner but yeah that's kind of in the back of my mind for sure um i don't see anything else in chat but i've got i've got a few that what maybe why these guys are coming up with stuff um one that i said was if you had to give one piece of advice to a club player or junior um to improve their squash what would it be well um yeah i mean from a like if you're playing a match or yeah i guess playing any I, it's really basic but i always say to people just hit the back wall because that's it's such a simple yet effective piece of advice like the amount of people who just leave the ball short because they're trying to hit perfect length or whatever um if you just try and over hit the ball and hit the back wall it's amazing what a difference that makes even at the pro level if we go on and you just think right i'm just gonna hit the back wall it generally means you're in front of your opponent. So that's, that's kind of the most basic yet important bit of advice I'd give, I'd say. Right. right. Best friend on tour? Mm. Well, he's just retired, but Chris Simpson would have been it. Right. <laughs> yeah, so Simpo, I mean, me and Simpo have known each other for years. So he's, he's yeah, he's a very good friend of mine. Um, so, but he has just retired. So current, currently probably... Adrian Waller or um, Joe Lee, I guess, because he's back on tour. Yeah, so, yeah, probably, yeah, probably 
like I'm I'm close with close with both of them and, and you, especially Adrian I've spent a lot of time with recently. So do you do you when you're looking at your schedules of what you're gonna play, do you and Adrian or Simpo or kind of sometimes try and go to the events because you want someone to travel with and they're a good buddy or is it completely selfish and if they happen to be there they're there or do you ever yeah no it's it's, it's completely selfish to be honest it's um we be. we will sort of talk about it we'll say oh like are you thinking of playing this thing like that but it sort of comes down to your decision in the end and then but buying like there's not that many sort of major events so you probably are going to play quite a few of the, the same events it's coming tight. Right. yeah um yeah okay next question is from eli and eli said when when playing matches what is your warm-up routine this is from adam yeah um i I tend to I, I tend to sort of get changed. I mean, I've got a very I'm trying to I was trying to like break it down there, but I've got a very sort of quite set routine. I'll get changed 45 minutes before, and then I'll I'll do like I've got some stretches I do first, and then I'll start sort of um, doing more dynamic stuff um, about 25 minutes before I play, and then about 10 minutes before I'll do sort of like really squash specific ghosting things like that, and then. I'll be good to go. So, I mean, that's, I've made it sound very basic, but I've got quite a set routine I go through. Um, but then when I, when I train, I have found that I actually am almost better just going on and training, not warming up too much. I used to warm up a lot before training and then I actually mm -hmm. found I was getting injured quite a lot in training. So now I tend to just go on and, and just get going most of the time. But in, when I play matches, that's a different kettle of fish. That's a good question because there's this. Well, I've talked about that before with other players. Like we are one of the few sports where you actually don't do the sport before you go on and play. Like yeah. um, a lot of other sports, they do. And and you're right. I I think it's more of an availability of the courts. Like if you're playing on a glass court, you can't. You, there isn't like a spare glass court to right. to try right. and warm up on. Um, I do. I mean, occasionally, if it's if if there's a court available and I'm playing on a traditional court, I might have a little hit, but. Yeah, I guess it's just because it's not so readily available. I think it's just not part of the routine, and that's why we don't do it. But I do think it is probably useful too. <laughs> I, I, not before a match, no. I mean, I do ghosting and stuff, but no, I wouldn't because I, I, I would find it a little bit kind of it might make my legs a little bit heavy or something like that. But um, okay. yeah. Yeah, I do. I mean, I do like a few court sprints and stuff just to get get sort of heart rate going and stuff. But no, not sure. not sort of treadmill stuff. Okay. So. <laughs> I've seen a few. Yeah, it's a good, yeah, I've seen a few weird ones. Um, I was trying to think. I mean, you see a lot of lot of players like being told what to do, which I always think is a bit strange. But then I guess a lot of sports are like that. They get told what to do. Um, I'm just trying to think of. I mean, to be honest, Gawad is the weirdest one because he literally will just like be sat in the corner, like on his back on the floor, lying down, doing nothing, and then he looks like he's about to go to, <laughs> you know, he's like on the beach or something, and then all of a sudden he plays, goes and plays. So he's probably the weirdest one in terms of you just would never expect it. But yeah, I don't, I can't think of any really, really bizarre ones. Yeah, well, yeah. From from the English, I don't, I don't actually know them all personally, but I think there's a, there's a pretty good crop of players coming up. There's um, a guy called Sam Todd who um, I think won the under seventeen British Junior Open, I believe, which is always a good indicator. Another guy called Nick Wall, who's another young good player, and then you know Charlie Lee from the club. He's he's a very, I think he's a very good player, but a bit struggled a bit with injuries and illness. Um, yeah, there's, 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 it seems like there's kind of a good group of sort of around nine, 18, 19 year old players. And then I think globally, it seems like there's a lot of good players from everywhere now, which is great. Um, like if you go, if you look at the British Junior Open, the, the amount of nationalities, there's obviously still a very big Egyptian influence um, and they have got some very good young players. But uh, hopefully there'll be a few more from sort of differing 
different places over the years as well. Um, well, I would just like to say thanks so much to, for Tom. Really appreciate you giving us your time. Um, um, Pleasure. Stay, stay, yeah, thank you. Stay healthy. Stay safe. Thanks everyone yeah. for joining the call. Um, Tom, yeah, I'm so sure I'll speak to you soon. Yeah. Um, thanks, guys.